when you're trying to convey information, it's important to talk to the, the heart and the head. You've, you've got to do both. And if, if you're just talking to the head and if it's purely just information and facts and, and evidence base, it doesn't really hit home on any emotional, visceral level. Welcome back to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast with myself, Owen Walker. In this episode, I'm speaking with Dan Pronk on his latest book released, The Combat Doctor. So what I wanted to do is dig into this new book and unearth some of the salient points and take home messages that Dan reflects on in The Combat Doctor. So this is Dan's fourth book that he's authored and or co-authored. And so we wanted to explore the different tacks he's taken in this book and illustrate some of the powerful learning that's occurred during his tours of duty. So Dan completed his med medical degree and served the majority of his military career with the Special Operations Unit serving four tours of duty in Afghanistan and over 100 combat missions. He was awarded the Commendation for Distinguished Service for his conduct in action on his second tour of Af Afghanistan. During his medical, medical and military service, Dan served as an Australian medical liaison to the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care, as well as representing the Australian Medical Operations at NATO Special Operations Forces Medical Expert Panel. So Dan currently works as a senior medical officer in the emergency department in a regional hospital and serves as the medical director for TACMED Australia, which provides tactical medical advice to a number of police tactical groups and other government agencies. So Dan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you kindly for having me on. It's great to be here. No worries at all. No worries at all. Listen, that's a fantastic bio, Dan, and some real, um, real diversity of experience that I'd love to, uh, love to dig in to with you. So what I'd like to start with, Dan, is just ask you, um, why you've written this book, uh, The Combat Doctor, and what's different about this book to the prior three books that you've uh, written? This one, basically, uh, I started writing this book first. So I'd, I'd written this book and, and it, it, the stories come out in the book, but I'd returned from my second tour of Afghanistan with Army Special Operations and it had been a pretty traumatic tour. So we'd, we'd gone and done our first tour and hadn't lost any task group members. And so I'd come back from that, I think, with this false sense of invulnerability. I hadn't had to to treat any of my teammates who were seriously injured on on that tour. And then on the second tour, in pretty quick succession, uh, I lost three teammates. So I was on the ground for all three. Uh, they were all either shot or had been uh, had hit IEDs and and I responded to them and couldn't save any of them. And so and, and it was a, a really kinetic tour aside from that. There was lots going on. It was a real uh, high pressure, sort of high energy, very professionally rewarding in a lot of ways, but very stressful with, with these traumatic experiences. And, and at the end of that, I, I came back to Australia and, and it was trying to make sense of it all. And, and in one of my, uh, post operational psych debriefs, the psych recommended I, I, I write down these events. So just kind of journal, you know, sort of creative writing, if you like, about all the detail that I could to try and get it straight in my mind around these critical incidents and start processing it. And that was really the genesis of this book. So I, I started with just these key critical incidents where I'd lost teammates and then found that I enjoyed the writing process. So I started filling in a few blanks uh, and wrote about a hundred thousand words, and then just it, it was a cathartic exercise initially. So I was still with the SAS and had you know went back to Afghanistan two more times. So it was never designed to be published at that stage. Sat on my computer hard drive for a lot of years, and and then got out of the army. Wrote a, a small self published book that I put out that was just a, a few distilled lessons from from this book. I I sent this off to Army Special Operations, what I had at the time, and and they came back saying, "Hey, no, nah, this is not suitable for publication. It, it needed a lot of editing. It had a lot of operational security stuff and." detail that wasn't appropriate and and then in the meantime became very interested after my army discharge in resilience and so went down that pathway of of teaming up with my brother and another guy called Tim Curtis other SAS veterans wrote the resilient shield and then it just uh, happened that it was it was the right time to come back and and to this original work 
edit it and 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 release it and so it's it's a it's been in the pipeline for for a long time and there's been a couple of books in the interim but uh that yeah this the story of this one starts about 12 13 years ago and it's finally finally got to press so dan looking at this book you know the resilient shield is far more instructional rather than maybe narrative and or emotive and you know you examine um psychological resilience physical resilience sort of mental and or spiritual resilience and you 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 really pass apart some of these some of the, the approaches that you can that an individual can make more themselves more resilient in all these domains and and it is, it is instructional could you maybe speak to the power of narrative in this book and what narrative does in in hitting home lessons learned in a, in a different way yeah look i think it's crucial and in in many respects the combat doctor is the the story behind why i became interested and we became interested in resilience and then led on to resilient shield so it it tells the story of of what led to that that deep interest in resilience and look i think to to the narrative's essential i mean I, and I, I heard this from a, an instructor i used to have when you're trying to convey information it's important to talk to the the heart and the head you've you've got to do both and if if you're just talking to the head and if it's purely just information and facts and and evidence base it doesn't really hit home on any emotional visceral level if you're talking purely to the heart and you're just telling stories that's great it's a great connection but it's it's more entertainment and and so resilient shield was we were desperately trying to find that balance between enough of the the vignettes and the stories and the things that people might relate to in terms of the um the talking to the heart and then using that as a bit of a, a trojan horse if you like to then deliver some some information talk to talk to the head and 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 balance the two whereas the combat doctor is is very much the the emotional kind of journey that led to the interest in resilience so Dan, just looking at some of the stories you reflect on within the book, and as you said quite candidly, you treated friends, certainly on your second tour, you know, it was a lot more involved, uh, a lot more visceral, uh, because you're, you're on the ground uh, treating, treating friends. Now, I've got 20 years experience within pre-hospital care as a paramedic and critical care paramedic, and have been to some horrendous um, scenes, but I've never had to treat friends, never had to treat colleagues that have been sort of for want of a better word dying in my in in my company in in my arms could you maybe just reflect on a few of those stories just maybe pulling out some of the salient points because reading the critique of of the combat doctor that some of the critique is that you know you, you won't get closer visceral stories than these these are uncensored stories you know that like you said they're, they're your reflections in practice of 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 your emotion of your gestalt of your of your processing uh, and trying to the application of medicine to to your friends i can uh, i can't relate to that but could you maybe just infer to the listeners how how powerful and difficult that was yeah it it was it was really interesting and i don't know that i had fully appreciated what that would be like. I, I think theoretically I had considered that I would have to treat people I knew, my teammates, my friends, but but it's like it's like any of these things. Until it happens, I don't know that you can appreciate what that experience is going to be like. And and as I said on my first tour, we were very lucky, few near misses, couple of people shot, no one killed. And and then the second tour, probably the 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 key pivotal moment happened uh, in, in May on that tour. And I, I talked to this in the book. We, we were a two day operation in southern Afghanistan and, and we were engaged. We inserted in the middle of the night. Um, actually the US 160th, the special operations aviation regiment put us in and, and we got engaged within about 30, 40 seconds of being on the deck and machine gun fire RPGs. And so it was, it was well and truly on. And, and we, it was pretty much a, a nonstop uh, firefight for 48 hours. And, and the first day didn't take any casualties into the second day. We started to take some casualties. We, we had a couple of guys hit by. Um, fragments from a grenade. We had a, a guy hit by a, a rocket fragment. And then in mid-afternoon, we had a clearance force moving forward into an enemy compound series 
uh, to, to clear some machine gun positions that, that we'd been getting a lot of fire from. And, and, and they struck an IED. So the, the lead man in that clearance force uh, initiated a large device and, and was very, very badly injured. And, and as was the, the man back from him, he was, he was quite badly injured by shrapnel. The other two just caught the blast wave without being hit by the shrapnel, thankfully. But the, the whole team was, was, uh, injured by this device and they fell back into a compound. The two lesser injured guys managed to, to recover the two more injured. And I moved forward with a quick reaction force, uh, on that occasion. And, and this was the first time that, that, well, a couple of things. One, that it, it was a, a mate of mine who'd been hit. I'd been, I had a, had a fair bit to do with this guy. Even in the lead up, he was the one coordinating the casualty evacuation of the previous casualties and, and a couple of other events over that 36 hours. And he was a, a guy I'd, I'd known for, for some years. And, and so it was the first time I'd responded to a mate of mine. But the other thing was, it was the first time as a doctor I'd responded to a critically injured casualty as the only doctor there. I'd certainly done it in my junior doctoring in hospitals, but it was always part of a resuscitation team. And you had other doctors. It was a, a uh, more controlled environment. You had a lot more assets. And and this was pre-hospital, mate of mine, and, and the buck stopped with me. And and we, we worked on on that guy for about thirty or forty minutes before we lost him, and uh, and so so that was a real pivotal moment. It was this sort of all of a sudden it was this realization we were playing for keeps that that this this illusion of invulnerability that I had was was a complete facade. And and I mean this guy was one of our best soldiers. He'd previously won the medal for gallantry. He was he was really a um, highly respected special operations soldier and and it sort of occurred to me that hey if this guy can get killed then you know none of us are safe and so it was a a real turning point and then there was another two in pretty quick succession uh so it was it was that just sort of that big gut punch of this is real these are my mates and this is on me to try and save them so Dan, looking at um, some of the sort of salient learning points that you bring through the book and indeed some of the medicine that you practice, albeit on friends and and or colleagues, could you maybe just speak to the, the lessons learned from a medical perspective? Because having... Uh, dealt with traumatic injuries myself throughout um, well-established non-combat environments, humanitarian environments, and and or otherwise. I, you know, I still have only had to apply a few of these, a few tourniquets in my in my twenty-year career. It's, it's, it's not that many, um, and indeed only treat relatively few blast injuries. But you know, you're you're categorically having to treat blast and ballistic injuries constantly through 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 your time did it did did the exposure to this certain sort of pathology start to start to sort of really embed lessons learned from from your perspective as as, as to what the ma- the major sort of hemorrhage points were or indeed the utility indeed even the utility of um of tourniquets did did did, did you start to become overtly familiar with treating sort of these blast and ballistic injuries yeah, look, we we did not not just myself. All these elements that were over in Afghanistan doing the pre-hospital stuff, but also when we were back on base, we had a, a good affiliation with. There was a U.S. naval special, uh, sorry, U.S. military special operations base that we used to work at. They had a Ford surgical team, and we'd go out on the uh, the dust off birds, the aeromedical evacuation, and and so even when we weren't out on missions. We were, we were in this really privileged position where we could get access to the, the, uh, Ford surgical teams and the dust off and, and get that exposure and build that corporate knowledge. And, and there was a, it, it actually, it, it sounds odd, but it's, it's actually remarkably simple medicine, battlefield medicine. And, and what I mean by that is, is when, it, when people get injured on the battlefield with either blast or high velocity gunshot, it's they kind of go one of three ways. Either they are so catastrophically injured that, that they are killed instantly or they're going to die no matter what you do. Uh, there's the other way where they're, they're hit but they're not going to die. They're pretty stable and you've got time to, to get them 
into a, a surgical facility and to, to manage them. And then there's the in-between, which are the ones that will die unless you intervene quickly. And, and that's a pretty short list of conditions. And so it's, it is the, the number one cause of preventable death on the battlefield is bleeding out from a, a compressible bleed. And so these are limb injuries, arterial limb injuries that you can get a tourniquet onto. And so your, your, your arterial tourniquets in the military context or the pre-hospital context are just fantastic, simple, easy, uh, you know, easy to use if you're trained well in high stress environments, low light. It's not a complex device if you're, you're trained in it and it's, it's life saving. So the tourniquets, or if it started, if the, the injuries, the bleeds started to get too high up to tourniquet, your junctional sort of wounds, groin, armpit, then it was either packing wounds or things like junctional tourniquets. Once you started to get into the, the abdomen or the, the, the thoracic cavity, the non-compressible stuff, not much you can do about that pre-hospital. You know, you can bind pelvises if it's blast and broken pelvis, but if someone's bleeding internally, they, you know, it's rapid evacuation. We would push blood forward so we could transfuse uh, in the field, so you could buy time to evacuate, but um, the non-compressible bleeds had to get out of there. And so it was basically stopping compressible bleeding was was number one. And then you start to get down into the, the finer print, which is tension pneumothorax or open pneumothorax. So once again, both pretty simple things to, to do the in initial management of in the pre-hospital environment, decompressing chests or covering sucking chest wounds and then simple airway manoeuvres. And so if you could do those basics well, then you could save pretty much all of the the, um, the preventable deaths on the battlefield. So so it was fairly simple. It, it wasn't cerebral medicine in any way, shape or form. We weren't, we weren't fine-tuning uh, arterial blood gases or pH balances or anything fancy like that. You're limited by the kit you've got. Oftentimes, it was more the complexity of the tactical environment that made the situation difficult as opposed to the medical management. So as we've spoken about already, Dan, you know, one of the most powerful uh, tools at your disposal really is, is narrative because it really unpacks the uh, and, and, you know, it, it relates to the imagistic sense of the reader where we can you can be there with you on 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 mission on the battlefield and and sort of really get a semblance of, of what you're having to deal with. Could you maybe speak to some of the non technical aspects um, that you pull out in the book um, of sort of around leadership? and fellowship, shared mental models, situation awareness, active listening, and, and or otherwise, because I, th I think sometimes they can be more instructional than some of just some of the clinical medicine. Oh, unquestionably. And for any military medical asset, that, that integration with your element is, is absolutely key. And so that comes down to that just just integrating to to be to be able to build a, a a military skill set to be able to demonstrate military competence and win the confidence of these elements and so for for us within and I served with both our SAS regiment and also our commando regiment and the the key thing for us as medical elements with those units was to integrate with that that fighting force otherwise you're not going to get a start either at the the planning table to do the mission planning it, it was also an understanding of of what the mission was and also mission primacy and providing medical care to a military mission or any austere environment, you know, be it uh, humanitarian type stuff, disaster relief. There's, there's a, an overarching context that often creates competing priorities. And, and so, you know, ideally, if you wanted to stack medical support to a, a special operations mission, Ideally, you'd have a bunch of people there. You'd have a, you know, a, a special operations surgical team. You'd have this, that, and the other. You'd take up just two of two of the helicopters just with your medical stuff. But obviously, if you went into the the planning room with that kind of plan, you 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 wouldn't get a seat at the table. So it was about that compromise. It was about that integration. It was about that understanding of the overarching context and and that acceptance that in effect we were a a, a pretty sort of costly insurance policy, if you like. We, we were costing 
the fighting force operators, you know, on the helicopters or insertion platforms. And so being respectful for that, trying to balance the best medical capability you could push forward in that overarching context, making sure you integrated and you kept your, your military skills up so you weren't a liability to the operation. And so, so much of that. And then on the ground, it was in those those settings where we did take casualties there was a huge requirement for that situational awareness. So, you, you know, you couldn't just put your head down and, and treat that casualty and just like you can in a, in a, a safe and, no, you know, pre-hospital environment's no different. That whole danger, DRABC, is there for a reason. You, you need to consider that context and, and consider the limitations of what you can do in the field. So, yeah, there was, there was so many other factors and you, you can make a strong argument that your medical skill set uh, was really sort of secondary or even tertiary to these other skills because if you if you didn't have those other skills and you couldn't get a seat on the insertion helicopter or you, you couldn't sort of get your, your way to the casualty on the ground, then the medical stuff all falls by the wayside. Dan, could you speak to sort of the real human side of the book, really? Because like you said, the, these reflections are a real humanistic perspective on on exactly what you were dealing with and you know in within your first book average 70k dickhead i think that's the that's that's the book yeah um you you know you 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 give this real human as reflection around you know this the, an average guy growing up be, being yourself and you know struggling through school not really being the over high performer but but actually committing to this lifelong learning and actually the, the 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 cadence of learning at starting to aggregate as you as as you get older so that so that actually you call things forward you become a, a, an iterative better uh, better version of yourself day day after day and that you don't have to nail it at the start. It's it's about committing to that lifelong journey. Could you maybe speak to that within this book from just a human human reflection upon your emotions, uh, aside to the medicine and even aside to the to, to the human factors or indeed the the non technical skills and 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 how you convey that within this book? Yeah, for sure. It it certainly and I mean to I, I do talk to all of that in average seventy kilo dickhead the that that always a little further that that sort of didn't really hit my straps at school had a go at being a professional athlete that didn't really work out but but uh, then had done some uni done okay there and it all sort of came together in this military medicine and that was the first time that I. I, in, when I found myself, particularly within special operations, where I'd really just found this absolute passion, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of gone into medicine, uh, not, not with any real passion. I'd gone into the army without any real passion. But then when I discovered that special operations existed and they needed a, a doctor, then, then that's where the passion ignited. And, and, and actually a big part of it, I've spoken about this quite, quite often was a, a, a British, uh, ex-military, bloke by the name called Richard Villa, who was a doctor with the, the British SAS during the Falklands War. He's an orthopaedic surgeon over there. And he wrote a book called Knife Edge. And that really sparked my enthusiasm for wanting to pursue medicine with the, with the SAS regiment. And, but it's when I look at that from a, a human perspective, the do, doing all that, that study and that training with this dream of going and doing SAS selection, it, it was all very, uh, this, I had this impression of special operations be, being all rose colored glasses. You know, it was all go fast and shiny and was desperate to be a part of it. And, and I think any outsider looking at special operations, that, that's how you see it. You don't, you, you kind of have this, this misguided, uh, perception of, of what, what a special operations unit is and, and probably an amplified perception of, of, don't get me wrong, they're, they're exceptional units. I mean, militaries are exceptional things in, in general, but, but, um, so it was all this, this sort of, uh, enthusiasm and this drive towards that and, and this ambition to, and then when Afghanistan started and it became clear that I was probably going to be hitting my career in the military, at a time where there would be wars to go to, Iraq was going on, Afghanistan was going on. Uh, I had this once again, this this naive enthusiasm. I, I wanted to go to war. I'd, I'd been training to be a doctor. I had this this aspiration to go and, and do SAS selection and then got the chance to do that and got through. And so it was all kind of falling into place and it was nothing but this 
this this passion and this uh, enthusiasm to get to war, to be involved in combat. I had this curiosity what that would be like, and and I think part of me looked at this as being the ultimate forum to to test your skills in. And and as I said before, it it was all theoretical, this idea that we might have blokes hit. I didn't have any uh, framework to have any visceral, emotional deterrent, if you like, as to what that might be like. And and so the, the, the my first tour of Afghanistan, which was my second tour with the Army, I'd done a, a trip with regular Army before I went into special operations, but first tour of Afghanistan, there was a little bit of combat, a little bit of of uh, a couple of casualties, but like I said before, nothing too serious. And so I'd come away from that just with this overwhelmingly positive experience and and just this absolute love for it and this desire to get back and and do it all again, but bigger. You know, I wanted I wanted more of everything. I sort of loved it. And and then that second tour was uh, was where they started to realize everything I spoke about earlier that, that, you know, I, 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 it was the old careful what you wish for because I, I got it all on the second tour. And then it was about, well, w- what does this mean? What do I do with this information? How do I change the way I practice? How do I change the way I train my medics? You know, and, and it, it's, it also as a, from a human emotional perspective changed me as a person. There's no question. It, it really uh, made me appreciate. The, the risk that was involved with the game. I, by that, by my third and fourth tour, I had two young kids at home, married with two young kids. I, I'd started to see the aftermath of not only the families who had lost their husbands, sons, you know, uh, loved ones, but, but also those that were really badly injured in helicopter crashes, blasts, gunshot wounds. And, and so I started to see this, the human toll of what we were doing became really clear and I started to really reflect on also somewhat the the selfishness of what I was doing I loved it I wanted to keep going back but but I, I knew beyond doubt now that I was you know my life every time you roll the dice it, it's you know your you, chances are you, you might be the one who gets hit and and so it wasn't just me it was my family as well so yeah it all kind of morphed uh, throughout the my, my last two tours approached it very differently. I just wondered, Dan, could you speak to the human factors within within the book? You know that of you know individual human factors around the the, the cognitive fatigue and and or chronic fatigue, um, command gradients, and you know the incremental workloads, and or the environmental or task human factors. You know, being in Afghanistan and all these places which are. Circus of fifty degrees Celsius down to down to freezing in in winter, and and everything that impinged on you from that perspective that that comes through in the book. Yeah, certainly it was, it was very there was what I found interesting about human factors is when you're within that bubble, you often don't notice that they're happening, and and this was a, an experience. When I reflect, I look at, and, and this came out in some of the investigations into the, the the blokes that we lost, when the investigations teams came in and started to ask questions like, well, how much sleep had you had in the 72 hours prior to this incident? H- had you eaten? You know, what was your hydration like? It's like you say, it's 50 degrees, middle of summer. You're limited as to what you can carry in on your back and for, for every litre of water you're carrying, that's a kilo less equipment be it military or medical that you're carrying so so you we, we did out of necessity run ourselves on occasion fairly sleep deprived uh, certainly very physically it was a very physically demanding role my average load uh, combat load would be about 50 kilograms by the time I added up all, all the the uh, military and the medical kit and so you're lugging this stuff around often at altitude uh, in in the heat you you you, so yeah, I mean there were all these all these factors, but yet we, we seem to manage to uh, function really well, and certainly not just me, but the whole element could do our job. And and I think you can counter a lot of these human factors by training to a point where you are unconsciously competent in your core skill set. So they're they're happening almost on autopilot. It kind of, I know it's not a perfect one for one, but I I certainly believe that the amount of training that we did allowed us to function in these highly complex environments 
uh, and do things like apply arterial tourniquets, you know, organise these casualty collection points, site landing zones, these sort of things were all just happening, you know. You'd, you'd be able to spit out a, a nine-liner, the, the casualty information. It, it would just reel off and, and you could think about the the um, tactical situation. And, and, and I believe that this, this really intensive training, just this, this high fidelity reality based training that we, we had the privilege of, of having invested into us really allowed us to counter a lot of these human factors. And I think also with hindsight operating in those high stress environments, you, your body just upregulates. You, you, you know, you are running on <laughs> stress hormones, cortisol, and, and and a healthy dose of, of caffeine and, and hydroxy cut and whatever else we could get our hands on to uh, to try and stave off the, the the fatigue. But yeah, I think you know you were so jacked up in these environments on stress hormones and that that you could endure that. But the problem was trying to come back off it at the end of a tour and wind back down. I found to be really challenging. Dan, as we sort of come into land on the conversation, just a few more questions. But just just one would be, if you could distill some of the sort of meta themes throughout the book, is are there any sort of consistent themes that roll through the book and that sort of compound and that keep coming out in in the chapters that you could uh, that you could speak to? Look, I think one of the the big themes, and I hope I convey this in a lot of uh, what I try and uh, sort of can put across in blog content in the books is is just the 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 that always a little further type principle that that these goals that you might be looking at in your life that seem really aspirational and pie in the sky type thing they're probably possible if you know and then I, I I hope I'm a, a good example of that and and you know the name of the, that first book that I wrote, Average 70 Kilo Dickhead, is a, the, the story behind that title was in the, the first chapter, but it's a, it's, it's a, a bit tongue in cheek, but it's very true. I'm a, I'm a 70 kilo bloke. I'm 175 centimetres tall. I'm not a physically impressive bloke. I, I, I did terribly, well, not terribly. I passed school, but I didn't do well. And, and despite that, there was no way I could have got into medicine straight out of school, but I eventually found myself in, in medical school and, and getting through. I, and, and, you know, then with this military goal, found myself in the army with my sights set on the SAS uh, regiment and, and managed to, to, you know, get over years, train up, get on SAS selection and, and uh, get through that. And, and so hopefully that sort of serves as a bit of a uh, inspiration to people out there who might be looking at these goals and thinking, oh, geez, I, I don't think I'm capable of that. Or, you probably are. And I think it is just a matter of of setting a goal, chipping away at it slowly but surely and moving towards it. I think uh, key among that also is is trying not to let your ego get in the way of, of doing things. And, and so I've, I've made a, a, a dickhead out of myself, uh, you know, dozens more times than I've done anything impressive. But but I, I like to think I've been one who's put myself out there, who's I, I try – to live by a philosophy of not dying wondering. So, you know, I'll have a go. And, and my, my military medical career started because I failed miserably at my first uh, desired goal to be a professional triathlete. I, I thrashed that for five years. And the truth was I, I just wasn't good enough, plain and simple. But it's, you know, nothing's ever lost. That, that was, you could look at that as a failure. I failed to achieve my goal. But it, it instilled good discipline, good fitness, Nothing, nothing was lost. That all translated across. Found a new goal and, and moved towards that. But, but I won't die wondering, you know. So, yeah, hopefully the the things, the themes that come through are most things are achievable if you're really willing to to dig in and have a go and believe in yourself. But you do have to drop your ego, put yourself out there, be vulnerable, and uh, and just and hopefully the other thing that comes through is, and I, I know that. Because of my experiences, I've I've got a very changed perspective on life, and and this this incredible gratitude and appreciation, this this optimism that wasn't there before I had these experiences in uniform, and and I mean this is all a part of, of what I what's I consider to be post traumatic growth. I've I've grown from these experiences, but but I think you know a lot of of um, 
how we experience the world it all comes in. It, it's what we do with the information, whether we choose to, to appreciate the good or fixate on the bad. And, and I've very much been recalibrated by my experiences. You know, my idea of what a bad day looks like is now really a pretty bad day. And so anything is, is pretty trivial. So just trying to, to stay optimistic, stay enthusiastic, drop the ego. And, and if, if there's something there that you really want to pursue and you, you think might be for you, have a go. Listen, Dan, that's powerful. And I think those salient learning points are, are absolutely key. And so just something you said earlier in the interview as we come into land on the conversation that I'd just like to ask you about is if you could just speak to the psychological mitigation or the power of psychological mitigation that, that, that you experienced through writing these experiences down, because like you said, this is, this is in, in essence a tour of your field notes and your, your reflections and and or um, your debrief and, and self debrief and, and, and reflections through through these uh, through these powerful and emotive and painful uh, recollections. Could you maybe just speak to how powerful it is to 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 really reflect and be a reflective practitioner at all times uh, in, in 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 practice? Because this has clearly come out in your book. You know, you, you've written a highly emotive, highly engaging book on the back of this. But it's also served to really hopefully psychologically mitigate and or put in perspective some of these emotive experiences. Uh, could, could you maybe just speak to that and how powerful it is for other people to do that who might be either in the military or EMS or police or, or any other services? Yeah, look, it's it's huge. And I can't speak highly enough of the importance to deal with this, these stressors and traumas in any of these first response organisations. And, and I, I think just backing up a step from that, what, one of the problems with any of these, uh, like a bit police, paramedicine, EMS, far, far east, military, is you, you do, once again, you recalibrate to this new normal, these, you normalise these exposures, which are very abnormal. So, you know, when you, if you're a paramedic or a police officer, you're probably seeing a lot of dead bodies, a lot of human suffering, this sort of thing, but you're able to keep functioning because you're trained and you get more experience and you get better at your role as you go along. And, and, it, and you, you start to, just because you can function in these high pressure environments doesn't mean they're not traumatic is, is a point that I like to try and make. You don't feel it at the time. I didn't feel it, anything accumulating during my service in Afghanistan. Uh, for, for the longest time and, and, and because you, you can function in that environment, you adapt to it. But, but the, it's at the end of the day, we're all still human. And, and I like to look at it as a, like a bucket, you know, that bucket analogy. You're filling up this trauma bucket and you're not going to notice when it's a third full or a half full. It's not until it starts to brim or overflow a little bit that you realize, well, hang on a sec. I've, I've got some work to do. And, and so to come back to, this uh, the idea of, of writing things down of journaling it's that is just such an awesome way to to process some of the stuff that's happening as you go along I think trying to maintain an awareness that your exposures are abnormal and that they are on a physiological level even if it's not a conscious psychological level even if you're not aware of it this this these trauma inputs are coming in and the more you can be doing to, to process, to try and make sense of it as you go along, I think the better. And I think that will make people a much better operator for a much longer time, give them more longevity in these roles and hopefully prevent that bucket starting to, to overflow to the point where, you know, the real, the wheels really do come off it. But the, the, the writing things down, I think works to a certain point. Uh, geez, I'd, I'd encourage any one in a high pressure role. Uh, like a first response organization to, to get themselves a psychologist. Once again, get, get that ahead of the curve. I didn't do this well. I, I didn't engage the psychologists as well as I could have in my military career. I wish I had of. I, um, I, I go to psychologists now regularly, but the, I mean, these are the people with the tools to help you process this stuff as you go along and, and it'll, it'll make you a bit, once again, better operator, more longevity. But, but certainly writing things down as you go is a great way of also doing a, a, um, you know, an after action review, a debrief of critical incidents. And it forces you to, 
uh, look at a more balanced view of what's happened. We, we tend to fixate on the negative. Humans suffer from a thing called negativity bias. And so if, if something's happened and, and something's gone wrong, we'll just fixate in on that. You'll lose sight of all the good stuff that might have happened around it and just fixate on that negative, ruminate on it. Whereas if you write down the, the incident from start to finish, everything that happened, you're probably going to find some pretty positive points in there as well. And, and these are things that, that you can improve, uh, sorry, that you can sustain and keep doing. And, and then when you do get to the negative, by writing it down, hopefully you can get a bit, bit more of a balanced view of it. And that can be a starting point to be able to either train or, or look at ways of doing it better next time. And, and it all comes out of this, this capturing, this journaling, this, this debriefing. Uh, the, the other alternative, if you don't ever revisit this stuff, and like I did for many years, you just keep trying to run from it and stay distracted and keep moving forward. Uh, sadly, it, it has a habit of, of catching up with you at some point. Dan, listen, that's fantastic recollections and absolutely, you know, absolutely advocate for that myself and around that committing to sort of lifelong learning and debrief uh, and reflection, but also knowing that's just part of the puzzle and uh, and installing regular counselling sessions uh, and and or other means of, 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 of releasing that bucket. I think that's a fantastic um, Im image as well. Dan, I just want to say thank you for, for the last hour and for your reflections um, and just just, uh, just, just really bringing home some of your salient learning points from this book. So, thank you. Absolute pleasure, Owen. Thank you for having me, mate. And Dan, just to say that uh, the book is out, I believe, on the 30th of August, The Combat Doctor uh, in the UK. And you can get it from bookstores and or, and or indeed online from the 30th uh, of, of, of August. We'll put links in the show notes so that you can find uh, links to the book uh, book there. And anything else to say from yourself, Dan? Just uh, with the hard copy books, the, sadly, the, the publishing contract is only Australia, New Zealand, so they won't find their way at this stage to the UK bookshops. But it is it, some some Australian booksellers will sell it internationally. Uh, you can get it on audio book or ebook internationally. And I, I do plan on having the hard copies available from, I've got a, a website, danprong.com. Uh, but that'll be a bit later in the year. Uh, they, they're not going to—they're not going to give me a bunch from the first production, uh, the first publication. So, I will be able to send them later in the year. But sadly, they won't hit the stores in the UK on the thirtieth. But ebook and audio will. That's fantastic. And we'll put also links to, to the website uh, within the show notes. So that's fantastic. Thanks again, Dan. It's a real pleasure just uh, just speaking with you. Excellent. Cheers, on. If you've enjoyed this episode of the World Extreme Medicine podcast, please subscribe, like and share. And if you want to meet lots of other risk taking, rule bending and inspirational people, then you need to be in Edinburgh on the 19th to the 21st of November for this year's conference. Tickets are on sale now. Go to extrememedicineexpo.com to find out more. <laughs>